Our next speaker, Jon Fahler, is an extremely experienced programmer. He's, uh, he's been programming for longer than some of you have lived, 25 years of experience. And uh, he's been working mostly on embedded devices for networking, just like me. <coughs> he lives in Stockholm, and uh, whenever he gets the chance, he sneaks to his cabin in the woods where he plays amateur woodworker and where he works on his conference presentations. His talk today is called What do you mean by cash friendly? Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and one more housekeeping item. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, wait till the end of the talk. Thank you. And also, since it's after lunch, it's perfectly okay to doze off, but no snoring, okay? No snoring. Um, I'm also active in the Stockholm C++ community, so if you're visiting Stockholm, get in touch. We can geek out with the like-minded people. That can be fun. Uh, the background for this presentation, it began, um, it was a few years ago, two, three, I don't remember exactly. Um, we had developed a, a new new device and then networking equipment and uh, we were just about done with it uh, and I was doing some stress performance measurements and let's say that the result was really 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 disappointing. Uh, so th this measurement was that I, I was adding and removing data flows like absolutely crazy uh, at and at the same time altering the network topology so that, so that data flows would need to be rerouted and Performance was nowhere near where it should be. So it started to try to figure out why. And it turns out that the, the central node controller, the, the network node itself is a distributed system with I don't know how many CPUs. But the central node, uh, node controller was pegged at 100% CPU. And I said, what? This problem should be limited by latency, not by, uh, by CPU. Why is this? So I started profiling the, the, the node controller CPU, and I found out that approximately 75% of, this, uh, of the cycles were spent in one function, schedule timer. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? OK, so here's what it looks like. This is an old C API. We have a time restruct with a, a deadline. Uh, a callback and, and use a pointer as is the norm in C, and uh, a prevnext pointer, so it's a, it's a double linked list. And uh, then we have the timeouts uh, singleton, of course, and this function schedule timer that does a linear search from the back until it finds the, the insertion point. And uh, cancel timer is really necessary. Almost all timers are cancelled, so it's important that that is a, a quick thing. I bet some of you can see a problem here. Uh, this presentation is uh, the presentation that I would have needed it all those years ago, because I am the author of that. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do is to give you an idea of uh, well, a, a mental model of things to keep in mind that tends to give you good performance by default and things to watch out for. Um, in defense of uh, younger me, uh, at that time when I wrote it, uh, there were typically around 20, 30 timers enqueued at the time. And Almost all of them were the the same duration, so to speak. So, so th they were almost always added to the end. So performance wasn't bad then. But when I did this performance benchmark, there were, I think, 25,000 timers. <laughs> <laughs> that did not work well. So I want to introduce to you uh, a, a mental model, a really simplified idea of the cache. And th this, this model includes that we have a cache, and it's small. And it consists of fixed-size K 
cache lines, uh, and those <coughs> those are also on fixed alignment. This is uh, important to know. The, these are limitations by by the CPU the hardware. And data access that hits the cache is really, really, really fast, and accesses that miss are really, really slow. And that's very much it. Thank you. Now, um, <laughs> uh, what I'm not going to include in this is uh, that in, in reality we have multiple levels of caches. And we have multi-core machines with uh, where each core has its own first level cache. I'm also not going through associativity because if you're writing generic software that you're going to run on a CPU that you don't know, you have no idea what the associativity is. So nothing I'm going to say today will help you squeeze the last possible cycle out of known hardware, but it will give you good ideas. I'm also not going to talk about threading. Actually, I'm going to say one thing. Uh, communicating changed data between CPU cores is super expensive, so do that as little as you can get away with. That's it on multithreading. And, important to know, all models are wrong, including this one, but some are useful, and I think this one is useful. So, my model of the cache is like this. We have, to the right, the main memory. It's huge. And then in the middle, we have a cache. It's small. This is actually ridiculously small with four cache lines. So we can see that it has a number of uh, words in it. And to the right, we see which address is cached. So when I run, run this program, if I want to read something from the pointer hot, we can see that hot is in cache. I just read it, and I'm done. Super fast, a few cycles. But if I want to read something from cold, we see that cold is not in the cache. Cold is on address 4042 hex. Th that is not listed in the cache. So what happens is that the CPU finds some cache line that it will sacrifice. It will evict the data from it. And then it can load the real data into the cache. And this is slow, 100 cycles, 200 cycles. But then we can access it. And if I want to write to this address, we can have an additional interesting problem. This is, uh, this is cold. I want to write. The CPU will find a cache line to evict. But let's say that there is some data that has changed in this cache line that has not yet been written to memory. So we don't have to write it first. And then it can evict the cache line, find the real data to, to read into the cache so that we can access it. But then the next access uh, from also called is actually not called anymore because, because we have this address, so I can do it right. And then sometime in the future, heavens knows when, this data will be written to main memory again. And this is a super simplification. If you've been to the earlier talks about how caches work, you know that it's a lot more complex. But I think this model works really well for reasoning about your software design. So this is how I think when I, when I write software. So let's, let's analyze this uh, timer that wasn't so good. So I have a, a program. I, I don't want to call it a benchmark program because it's way too simplistic for that. But it, it exercises the system enough to see the cache effects. So I have a, a loop 20,000 times. I schedule a timer with some random number for the deadline. Some do nothing uh, function and a null pointer because I'm not doing anything really. And every second revolution through the loop, I cancel the previous timer just to mess a little bit with it. And after this 20,000 element loop, where there are now 10,000 timers left, I shoot all of them. And shooting them is just checking. If, if the list is empty, return false. Otherwise, pick the first element, call it, and drop it. OK, good. So first tool, uh, 
Valgrind and the, the most people who use Valgrind have <laughs> used it for uh, finding uh, memory related errors. But uh, Valgrind is a CPU emulator that has a lot of tools, and Colgrind is, is one of those that are it's really cool. So, Colgrind is a kind of profiler, it, it, it collects information about your program at runtime, the where you are, how you got there, uh, the number of calls, uh, time spent. Uh, it's absolutely not cycle accurate, so take timings with a uh, huge pinch of salt. But it gives you a broad picture. But here's the thing, you, you have also, you can add to Colgrin the cache sim. So now it simulates that your CPU has a cache and uh, it also, it's a little bit simplified. It says you have an instruction level one cache, a, a data level one cache, and then you have a last level cache, and it ignores everything else. But default, the L1 cache uh, is the same as on your host CPU. But if you're doing cross-compilation, if you want to check something for another CPU with a completely different kind of cache, you can actually configure it and, and say, no, on this system, the cache lines are at whatever size uh, and uh, you have this associativity, etc. So it, it can be useful. And then I also add dump instructions because I want to see the assembly instructions that take time. Normally, Valgrind collects information on source lines. And this can be insufficient. And then also a branch simulator uh, that simulates branch prediction. Uh, and it does not try to emulate the, uh, the actual target CPU's branch predictor, but it's a branch predictor. And it's super slow. 20x slowdown is nothing. It can be much worse than that. But um, it collects really good information. So let's give this a try. So. We have this uh, timer, the schedule timer function that you saw, cancel timer, shoot first, and the, the main that goes through everything. No, not that one, not yet. So now we can run it. And um, as I said, uh, Valgrin is a CPU emulator. So it, it is emulating your CPU in software, collecting information about every single instruction, where it is, how it got there, how many times it got there. And it simulates a cache also. So every data access, I it collects information about whether it was or was not in, uh, in hot cache and uh, for all levels. And this takes a lot of time. It's really, really, really slow. But we should get um, get some information now. You on the first row can hear the fan on the on the computer. <laughs> but it gets uh, very detailed information. So we should get here. We are, have it now. So we have first we get just a collection of statistics. So we see. Two and a half billion instructions, a billion data accesses, 700 million D1 misses. 70% D1 misses. That is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's actually a feat. It's not easy to write software that misses the cache so, so badly. <laughs> uh, a billion branches uh, and uh, an insignificant number of mispredicted branches. So we have some information here. Uh, but the really cool thing is the visualization tool K Cache Grind. You can see a lot of things. You can choose what you want to focus on, like uh, is the instruction fetch a problem or whatever. But uh, I'm interested in the L1 miss sum, and you can see here to the left that yeah, 99.62 of all percent of all L1 cache misses were in schedule timer. Yeah, we sort of guessed that it was a problem, right? And then we can look at 
this function. So we can see 66% misses in uh, this loop and 33% misses in uh, get getting the address of the previous element. And more precisely, we can look at the assembly always end up in assembly. If it's not here, it's in, uh, in, in Compiler Explorer. You always end up there. So 66% in comparing whatever's in the RBX memory address with EBP and jump to, OK. So this must be the deadline. 66% cache misses on the deadline and 33% on getting to the previous element. All right. We have enough information to go on. So let's analyze this. We have this struct. We have a deadline that's four bytes. We get a padding of four bytes because the callback is a pointer. It needs to be on 64-bit uh, on alignment. And then another eight bytes for the user pointer and eight bytes for the prev and next. So we have a f sum of 40 bytes. And we saw that we had 66% cache misses on reading deadline. And this is maybe not very surprising. E every time we get to a timer by following a pointer, we can assume pretty much that th this struct is not in, in hot cache. So it's a cache miss. And since this is the first thing we read and we make decisions based on it, it's pretty much guaranteed to be a cache miss. So here's a rule of thumb. When you follow pointers, assume it's a cache miss. Ju just assume that following a pointer is a cache miss unless you have very specific information to the contrary. And then we see that we had 33% cache misses in following the, the prev pointer. And this actually makes sense. We see that the, the structure takes 40 bytes. Cache lines on this CPU are 64 bytes. So when we follow a pointer to a timer struct, deadline is a cache miss, all right? And then we have a roughly 50% chance that prev is on the, on the same cache line or on the next. So it makes sense that we see this, this uh, cache miss pattern. OK. So chasing pointers is expensive. Let's get rid of them. So why not do this? We have a, a much smaller timer data struct here with a deadline and an ID. I will get back to the ID very soon. Uh, user pointer and the callback. And now we just have 24 bytes, and there's no pointer chasing. Yay. And I store them in a vector. So it's a linear structure. And schedule timer now becomes a, a linear search where you first make place for the new element, and then you shuffle them back one by one until you find the correct insertion point, and then you add it. This is an enormous amount of work. The CPU really has to, to work hard here. A lot of instructions being made, a lot of data being shuffled. And we store the new one with a, a, a timer ID, and that is because cancel timer. We, we can no longer have a pointer to where this entry is. It's somewhere in memory. It's moving. So we add an, an identity that we can search for when we want to cancel it, and then we do an erase. So let's go to... The next tool, perf. Linux perf is uh, pretty amazing and uh, can be quite baffling also. So mm. anyway, perf stat presents statistics from the whole run of a program and uh, it, it uses counters from hardware and from the operating system. So the overhead is really, really low on this one. And then we have to choose which events we need to or want to observe. Um, it has a, a set of defaults. They are not ideal, I think, not at least not when searching for cache-related problems. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at cycles and instructions because it's sort of a good proxy for seeing how busy the CPU is. If, if, we ha if the CPU is uh, very busy, we have several instructions per cycle. If the CPU is waiting a lot, th then it's r the reverse. We have several several cycles per instruction. And then we can look at the L1D loads and the L1D load misses so that we can see 
how well we managed to hit the L1 cache. And I will get back to speculative execution later because these can really, really, really confuse the results. And this is super fast. Th it's very low overhead uh, on this one. So don't be afraid to use it even on, on quite heavy computations. It's, it's, it's not a problem. And there's also another one that gives more detailed information, perf record, that it, it does per just purely statistically, it samples your program during execution now and then and see where are you, where did you come from, what, uh, what are the counters right now. Uh, but it goes without saying that if, you're, if you have a hotspot that you spend the majority of your cycles in, you will statistically hit that very often. And then you have the same flag for uh, choosing which countries you want to look at. And then you have I find it really useful to add the call graph because by default it just says you were here, but it doesn't say how did I get there, wh wh who called this function. Uh, I've forgotten what LBR stands for. Um, there are three methods for getting the call graph. The one using frame pointers, one using the dwarf debug information. But uh, LBR doesn't need any of those. It uses hardware support from, from CPUs that do support it, and the CPU on this machine does. So it's, uh, it's both faster, and uh, you don't need to compile your program in any special way. And it's also very fast. Not as fast as perfstat, but it's really fast. Like 5 10% overhead. So this is, this is good. So let's have a look. So I have the linear array, and we can do just for fun. We can do perfstat on... Uh, the linked list. You remember how long I had to talk to sort of make time pause? Okay, 3.6 seconds. So this is roughly a little bit more than 10 times faster than using uh, Valgrind's call grind. So, but we see uh, again the same kind of information. We have 70% cache misses from uh, a billion loads. But then let's do. Let's do the linear array instead. Wow. That is quite a difference, right? But look, it's, it's doing three times as many instructions because it does a whole lot of work, but it finishes in like four times faster. So that is something. And we see the L1 loads are actually increased a lot, but the load misses are a, a lot fewer. Oh, maybe this cache thing is important. <laughs> uh, we, can we can do perf... Uh, record just to see where we spend the cycles. Uh. So, perf report to see where where things happen. This is a this is I, I have mixed feelings about this tool, let's say that. Uh, its uh, UI is uh, <laughs> perhaps not state-of-the-art. Um, but, okay, still spend a lot of time in uh, Schedule Timer for sure. Uh, what happens here? So, okay, it's, it's, this is uh, where we move the data around. I think, yeah, plus 18, that is uh, hex, that is 24. So we move, it, we move the data back one entry. So this is where we have the cache misses, but it's still, or where we have the cycles, I should say. We can look at uh, load misses instead, and uh, may move, oh, that is interesting. Oh. 
Okay. So, what can we conclude from this? Um, b when writing this one uh, presentation, I asked on Twitter what surprised you the most. I, I think Miro Knaip just nailed it. Doing more work can be faster than doing less. And I, I had a lot of other really good comments on this one, but uh, he just won. <laughs> he just won. This, this, is, this is just stunning. I just showed you doing something that is absolutely patently stupid was four times faster. Yeah, that was that, that was my CS education gone. Uh, but linear search is still expensive. Should should we try a binary search? Uh, can be worth it. So it, it's, it's dead easy to implement. We have the same time of data. Uh, we changed the return type from. Um, from scheduled timer to be a timer that includes a deadline and, the, and an ID. We still store them in this vector. It's, it's already sorted. So doing a, a linear search with a lower, bind, lower bound is easy. We find the insertion point and then we do an ins insertion. The insertion is obviously linear. It needs to copy the data away. And then cancel timer becomes also a, an equal range for finding all the timers with the same deadline, there can be several, and then we just do a linear search in that range for the item to erase. All right, so can that be, can that be good? You can try it. So we can try the, just f so we have the, numbers to compare with, and uh, the, the search array. So roughly twice as fast. Number of instructions is down considerably. What's this? Actually, when I presented this, uh, let's see if I can manage to get it. Yeah. What do you say about that? <laughs> this is Spectre. <laughs> what you're seeing is the effects of um, speculative uh, execution, where if, if the computer tries a path that uh, includes a memory load, and then this uh, memory load doesn't happen, it's still a cache miss. You evicted something from the cache but it doesn't count as an access because it didn't happen. I was just a little bit surprised when I got this <laughs> result, but th that is actually what's happening. It's, uh, it's speculative execution that, that ev evicts cache lines without them counting as data accesses. So, yep. Computers are fun, aren't they? So we can do we can do a perf record on this one just to see what happens. So now we know where are the cycles spent. Okay, may move. Load misses. Uh, may move. Inst oh, sorry. Instructions, uh, may move, okay. So the conclusion must be that to go faster, we need to write a faster may move, right? No. Whenever you do any kind of um, optimization regarding memory accesses, you sooner or later end up with may move being the, the bottleneck. And no, that does not mean that your task is to write a faster may move. Your task is to find ways to avoid doing may move. So, we saw here that th the searches weren't just there at all. We, we couldn't find them. So, so yeah, the, the binary search was good in, in this case, where th there was a lot of data and it, it reduced things a lot. And it was roughly twice as fast, but ridiculously many cache misses. 
And uh, this is, th like I said, th this is this is spectre. This is a failed branch predictions that re lead to cache entry evictions. Confused the heck out of me. Shall we try a map? Everybody likes bashing map. Maybe, I mean, we saw, definitely saw that the binary search is, the binary search is faster. And the map is just, it's always binary search. And it takes away the need for, uh, for the mem moves. So I can write the code like this instead, where I just have this really simple timer data with uh, a callback and a user pointer, and use a multi-map, because it can be several, several entries with the same deadline. So the implementation is super simple. Just do an insert or erase. And shoot first, you just check if, it, if it's empty, we're done. Otherwise, take the first one and erase it afterwards. So let's try. Yeah, I should say, by the way, I've, uh, I'm using all, all these examples. I use O1 optimization and uh, compiling with the debug info. The reason I'm using O1 is because it's, uh, in my experience, it's a decent uh, compromise that uh, O0, the, the, the code generated, is just too stupid to be useful. But with O1, you it's not as efficient at all as with, uh, uh, with higher optimization. So you cannot really use it to compare performance uh, really, but, but it, it's, it's enough that the data access patterns tend to be the same. So you get the same uh, cache misses and cache hits while still be able to reason about the code, understand to follow it, which you may not be able to do at higher optimizations. Um, this may perhaps n not be true for very much longer because uh, modern compilers begin to, uh, at higher uh, optimizations, see that they can optimize away memory allocations. So uh, we'll see. For, for now, it's at least in this program, it is true. So let's get the this one to compare with and try the map. What do you think? Is the map faster or slower? Yeah. Slower, yeah, sure. Pop. <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit surprised by that one too. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's obviously not slower. Actually, this one is uh, so fast that it's kind of hard to get reason reasonable information from it. So let's, let's change it to run a few more iterations. Uh, so if I run this, what we see is it obviously takes a lot longer, so we cannot compare the figures, but we can definitely see that there are a lot of branch misses. A fairly high amount of, of load misses. Um, let's see. Let's do the record thing so we can, can see where the cycles go. Not any longer. Uh, so. Where are our cycles spent? In schedule timer, we see definitely that we spend a lot of time in balancing the uh, the tree because it's a it's a the map is a red black tree, so it needs to do some rotations and, and stuff. Schedule timer. Okay, I cannot honestly say that I, I follow the all details in this one, but uh, I think this source code gives an idea of what's happening here. So this is where it has followed a pointer to the, the node, 
and it wants to check the the key, the deadline, if it is greater or equal, and we, we loop it. And, and that makes sense. It's we, We're following a pointer. We get a cache miss by... That's just how it is. We, we get a cache miss because we're following a pointer to some random node. And so that, that is where our problems are. So even though it's it's definitely faster than the other one, we see that the cache misses are on the same places too. Uh, but there should be room for improvement, I think. There definitely should be. So it is fast. But we have a lot of cache misses when comparing keys and rebalancing the tree uh, because it's, it's node-based. We're, we're chasing pointers, and that is bad. And more than that, it, it's, it, it does too much work. It, it, the, uh, the map tries to hold a, a, a total sort order of all timers, and we don't actually need that. We, we don't need to know which is the 101st timer to shoot. We need to know which is the first. So we don't need a total order. And looking at graphs, you should take these graphs with a huge pinch of salt. You may notice, for example, that there are no error bars here. So see these as a general idea of what we can expect. It's really difficult to see anything on this one. But if we do a comparison and see how does the binary search do compared to linear and how does the map do relative to linear, we see that, yeah, both are a lot faster for huge amounts of data but up to roughly 100, 200 elements, then linear is definitely king. How many data structures do you have where you need to, s to do search on sorted elements that are more than 200 elements? And not just search, insertion, modifying. So as, as long as your data set is small, definitely linear. Absolutely, no doubt. The logarithmic axis becomes important when we're at huge numbers. So keep that in mind. But can we do logarithmic without chasing pointers? Enter my one one of my favorite data structures, the heap. And with the heap, I don't mean the free store for new and delete. I mean the data structure heap. The heap looks like this. It's a perfectly balanced, partially sorted tree. It's partially sorted in the sense that every node is sorted after or the same as its parent. But there is no relation at all between the siblings. So sometimes the right sibling is greater than the left one, and sometimes the other way around. And there is at most one node with only one child, and that is the last one. That child is the last node. So everything is always compacted to be perfectly balanced and slightly slanted to, uh, to the left. And the way you do operations on this, if you want to insert something, you create a space to do an insertion, you trickle down elements that are greater than the one you want to uh, to insert until there is none, and then you can insert into that space. So let's say we want to insert seven. We make space for the seven, but we compare with the parent, ten. Ten is greater, so we move it down. Now we have a new hole. Compare its parent, it's eight. Eight is greater, so we move it down. Now a new hole. Its parent is three. Three is not greater than seven, so we insert seven here. Good. And then popping the top, the top is always the, the first element, the lowest element. So we just remove it and trickle up the child that is lesser un until there is no child to trickle in anymore. Then we can take the last element and chuck in in that uh, hole and maybe trickle it up towards the root if necessary. So remove the top, the lesser child is five, so get it there. Six is the lesser one, nine is the lesser one. And then we can move 10 into that spot and we remove the, this hole. And therefore, it's, it's always perfectly balanced. It's, uh, 
and it's partially sorted, but that means that we always have the smallest element at the top. So this is good. If we give each node uh, a number, an index, that it, this is where it becomes interesting, because the index of a parent node is half of the node, and conversely, the the left child of a node has twice the index, and the right child has one more. Which means that we can actually store these in a linear structure, like so. So these are array indexes. We just do simple arithmetic on array indexes, so no pointer chasing necessary. But a problem now is that the heap is not searchable, so how do we handle cancellation? Because cancellation is kind of important. Well, the way I choose to do this is I, I have a separate structure, the timer action, and I have a, a vector of actions. And over time, there the will become holes in this one, uh, but that doesn't matter. And we have the, the heap with uh, a, a much simpler data structure that is just the deadline and indexes into this uh, action vector. And this means that this timeout struct that we're juggling around, trickling up and down in the heap, it's only eight bytes now. So we have a really small moving data set. That is important. And we cancel by just setting the callback to null because that doesn't make any sense anyway. Uh, a problem with this is uh, obviously that when you cancel, in all previous examples, cancellation meant that the data structure shrunk, shrunk in size. This one remains the same anyway. So in this program that I had that, that exercises this structure, we could see that we cancelled half of them. So this means that this data structure will now be twice as large as it used to be. But this is a log two data structure. Twice as large means one more level. Peanuts. So don't worry, that is okay. So we can do it like this. We have our time of data comparison and did you know that the heap exists in the STL? It's called priority queue. Uh, priority queue is an adapter that you, you have to provide the data structure that it will implement it in. That is the vector here. So schedule timer now becomes a pushing the entry into the actions vector, get the index, push into the queue, and return the, uh, the index. Shoot first becomes more difficult because now the top entry may be cancelled, so we have to loop over all the cancelled elements and just consume them until we either run out of items or we have one with a callback. So let's have a look at this one. So we have the map for comparison and the heap for comparison. Okay, twice as fast again. Whoa, this is good. Number of instructions slightly fewer. Number of L1 loads down a lot. Half as many misses, half as many branches. A lot fewer branch misses, good. Good, good. So, let's see where we are with this one. Uh, to see where the cycles are actually spent. Adjust heap, okay, that makes kind of sense. Push heap, schedule timer. Uh, wow, we're seeing the, the the linear time addition of new nodes. Wow, cool. So we have optimized this en enough that the uh, the dynamic part of this program, the juggling with the data structures, is becoming 
well, it, it, it's still dominant, but, but we can actually see now the, the simple uh, O1 uh, operations. I, I, so we're getting close to the optimum, I, I would say. And just for we comparison, we can look at the misses and the yeah, it's the same. It's uh, that it's in this moving the elements up and down. So yeah, makes sense. So this is good. I mean, everything is less except time. Well, no. Especially time. It's half as uh, half as long time to do everything. So this is really good. And if we look, well, okay, we cannot really see. Well, we can see that the heap is uh, the the green one to to the right. So it's it's better or for a uh, high number of elements. For low number of elements, we can see that yeah, linear is still better up until roughly a hundred elements thereabouts, and it's consistently always faster than the map. Okay, reality restored again, map sucks. Okay, good. Uh, so, there are still cache misses though in the uh, heap adjust functions. Can we, can we do better? Yeah, this is the uh, overachiever me coming in, I'm sorry. Uh, so, if we look at the, the heap that we have here, uh, and it is stored as an array with cache lines. So here we have one color for each cache line. And if we look at how an um, axis is traveling across the structure, we see an important thing. We have one new cache line for every generation that we traverse in the structure. That is kind of wasteful. So I spent some time thinking about this should be possible to do better. What if we could get the data like this instead? So we have a heap of small mini heaps where each mini heap fits in one cache line. Can we do that? So now if we do that, we see that we get three generations per cache line. That must be better. It absolutely must be. So how do we do this then to, to make it fast? So we have this mini heap of seven elements. Well, we can store them as before uh, uh, as a, a small array. We add a sacrificial zeroth element that we just don't care about. Yeah, 12 and a half percent memory waste, who cares? And then its child, its first child, and its first sibling. But these are sizes of of eight, which means that we can do arithmetics with uh, masking and shifting, and we live in cache hits a lot. And this is with an absolutely crazy fan out because we, we now get this heap with that is log eight in terms of cache lines. But the code becomes quite messy. So in this code I decided, uh, for some reason I have forgotten, I, I called these mini heaps a, a block. So we have um, the block offset is just mask off the of all the high bits. The, the lower three bits are where we are in, in the current mini heap. Uh, block base is just a, from a from an index anywhere in this huge vector that contains the heap, we can get to where, where does the current mini heap begin? The, the sacrificial zeroth element. The block root is important to know because when we traverse up towards the, the root of the heap, we we have different logic. If, if we're not at the root, we just half the local index. But if we are, are at the root, we need to do this log eight operation to find the correct parent. And likewise, when you traverse towards the bottom, you need to know if I'm at, uh, at the bottom so that I can know if going down means uh, duplicating the local index or if it means uh, going uh, this log eight thing. And this logic is definitely more complex. So we see that if, if, it's, uh, if it's not a leaf, then sure, it's simple, just local addition. Uh, but the alternative case where we change 
mini heap is kind of messy. And likewise, to get to the parent, it's simple in the, in the case that we take two times out of three, but messy in the uh, third case. And then, this is all for naught if, uh, if our data structure isn't aligned. So we need an uh, aligned allocator. To my knowledge, there is none in the standard library. I may be misinformed. But it's easy to write one. So just have an align allocator that takes a number that we need to align on. And uh, this one should really have a few static asserts to ensure that the, that the size is a power of two and that it's uh, sufficiently aligned for the type T, but uh, slide where. So we know what the alignment is and we use, I choose to use C++17, the aligned operator new and delete. You, you can do this in older C++2, but it's a bit more elaborate. And from there, we are pretty much done. I can, can show you this one. Yeah, this data structure, by the way, is called a B heap. If you didn't know, it, it has a name. I didn't invent it. <laughs> Look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, so we have the heap and we have the B heap. Oh, it's slower, damn. A lot more instructions, more cycles, more loads, more everything. Well, not more everything, a lot fewer load misses, so we gained something. But this is without one. Maybe we should try this one. And do that comparison instead. I'm nervous now because sometimes it actually is slower. <laughs> <laughs> it's roughly the same. It's uh, slightly faster, but this is not a proper benchmark, so you cannot really see, say that much about it. But we can definitely see that we the goal of reducing cache misses was achieved. And for reasons I absolutely do not understand, there are a heck of a lot fewer branch misses compared to the using the standard libraries heap. There are more instructions per cycle, that is true, uh, because there are a lot more instructions. And that makes sense, because the, the logic is a lot more complicated. So th that is not surprising. But if we look at this one, Oh, we cannot really see anything on that one, but if, if we compare the heap and the B heap compared to the map, we can see that it's consistently faster. The B heap tends to be a little bit faster still. But have you heard it said that micro benchmarks like these aren't really useful for assessing performance of a small part of your program? That is not necessarily true, but there are two reasons why this definitely can be true. One is that it's extremely difficult to make a representative uh, benchmark. But the other thing is you need to know the context of where your data structure is used, how it is used. This is a timer in a system that it does something, it schedules a timer, it does something, it schedules another timer, it does something, it cancels a timer, it does something, it fires a timer, it does something, etc. Having fewer cache misses for each of these timer operations means that the rest of the program has more of its data in hot cache. And that improves performance of the whole system. So this particular case would have actually been beneficial for s whole system performance even if the operations themselves had been slightly slower, just because the rest of the program has more of its data in hot cache. That is worth thinking about, and I have not heard a lot of people mention that, that little bit about optimizing for cache behavior. And that is pretty much what I had to offer today. So some rules of thumb, though. Assume that following a pointer is a cache miss unless you have specific information to the contrary. Smaller working data set, 
is better. But do remember that I showed the, the last B heap where I'm actually sacrificing data. But that is not the, the working data set, that is the total memory consumption is greater. And use a much, as much of a cache entry as you can. When you have taken the penalty of loading data from raw memory into cache, make use of that. Don't read a whole cache line to check one bit and then go on. Do make more of it. And sequential memory access is really fast, especially when your data set is small, because the, the CPU does prefetching. When you start doing an access pattern with one address and just go forward with a steady stride, the, the CPU pretty soon sees, I see what you're up to. I bet you're going to load that address soon too. So it starts doing it. And then when you need it, it's already loaded. So sequential accesses are fast. And fewer evicted cache lines means more data in hot cache for the rest of the program. Depending on what you're doing, this may be super important or it, or it may be completely unimportant. You need to know the system you're working in. And mispredicted branches can evict cache entries. And this can lead to extremely confusing results if you're, if you're not aware of this. And measure and measure, and measure, and measure, because you can, to some degree, reason about what you can expect, but you will be wrong, often. So measure, observe, try to reason from why do you observe what you observe. Make a change, measure again. Some uh, resources worth looking into if you want to learn more. Ulrich Drepper's uh, paper, What Every Programmer Should Know About Memory, is absolutely amazing. It's definitely not what every programmer should know about memory, because it starts with how you make transistors. <laughs> but, it's, but it's really good. I, it, it says so much. Uh, Million Wolf uh, had a presentation about uh, using Linux Perf. Uh, it's, it's slightly less than one hour. Uh, it's, uh, it's really good. I learned a lot from watching that video. Travis Downs Cache Counters Rant. Um, just Google that. Travis Downs Cache Counters Rant. It's really worth reading. That was his response to me tweeting about how on earth can I have more cache misses than data accesses? <laughs> and he really explained a lot of what is happening, how Linux Perf works, how what counters it has, with what they are. And last one, Emery Berger had an absolutely amazing presentation at the Strange Loop conference this summer, uh, where he talks not about optimization and definitely not about caches, but uh, about benchmarking and how to measure and what things mean and how you can know that a result is actually significant. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. We have uh, just two minutes, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Uh, thank you for the speech. So tell us, uh, which implementation did you leave in, the in your code? Uh, it's, uh, it's a variant of the last one uh, that we use in the code. It's, uh, it's more contrived, uh, partly because uh, it's older. Uh, it doesn't use the... Uh, C++ 17 uh, allocators, and it's also uh, generic. It's uh, it's a template on a, a timer on T, and it has an elaborate uh, interface so that I can the, the the actual timer implementation allows to reschedule the first one, and it's faster to to do that in one operation than to pop it and then insert it at the back. But th that one is actually used the B heap implementation. Yes. One more question. Thank you for a really nice uh, re uh, presentation. I uh, uh, saw few presentation about the performance cache misses, but this was the first one with the live demo. So before this one, I thought they didn't 
they don't really exist. <laughs> <So> <laughs> they, they just show some slides. Yeah. They do exist and they yeah. make a huge difference, yes. So uh, my question is because um, uh, each time uh, after this uh, such uh, conferences, uh, I never really applied this knowledge to my work because uh, although I'm working in uh, embedded system programming, but usually we are uh, working with the uh, applications and while uh, developing the applications, we don't uh, uh, have the hardware in mind. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is if we should consider the hardware or only when um, some uh, performance issues uh, um, um, are uh, occurred, or um, there is a way to apply this knowledge during y our work. Yeah, I think, no, you use these rules of thumb. Well, th to just say that, avoid chasing pointers. Use linear access uh, unless the data sets are huge. When the data sets are huge, do try to do a logarithmic or something that is uh, better uh, from a, a complexity point of view, but again, still try to do that without chasing pointers, and then you're pretty much there. So th apply that, yes. B but you usually when uh, you are writing your code, you have, uh, you have the problem solving uh, to solve the problem, yeah. and you are, you are uh, uh, following the common practices. What is the best algorithm to solve this problem? And uh, usually you are going for for the algorithm which uh, is uh, is faster, yes. And you don't have you, you are, for example your example was g great uh, when you use the linked list first, and that is I guess the first uh, solution which comes to m mind of every every developer. Yeah, and that that is a problem. Linked list should be the last resort when the, when all other data structures are wrong. Uh, it, there are actually situations where a linked list is where you what you want to use, but they are extremely rare. So d d you use vector by default. I, if you don't have information to the contrary, d default to vector. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We run out of time.